it, you know, the old adage of it takes a village, and this took, as Charles wrote that panel said, it took our village. Um, I think it was very appropriate. He did that because Tortilla Flats, the people that lived there, were such a tight-knit community and continue to be a tight-knit community that we, to, in order to produce this exhibit, we had to link into their community. This is definitely one of those stories that we couldn't tell. This is a, a, an exhibit where the community needed to tell their story. So we were uh, extremely fortunate, and Ana Bermuda spent uh, hours, Linda Kennedy, one of our volunteers, did oral histories or uh, oral interviews for the video portion. So this was uh, all the behind the scenes work that shows up in the exhibit was untold conversations, home visits, um, bringing people to the museum, uh, a lot of elderly people that had to be, re you know, reach out to them. I loved the, the day that uh, one of the teachers from the May Henning School came, and I don't remember his name at the moment, um, but he came to the museum, and he's in his late 90s. So there was a lot of that kind of um, reaching out and, and inviting people to tell their story. So this, I think, this kind of exhibit is what we're all about, so I'm extremely proud to even be here and be part of this exhibit as it's happening. I'm going to invite um, Ana Bermudez to come up first so she can sort of give an overview of what this exhibit was about, how it kind of came to be a little bit, and then she can pass the baton to our other our other speakers as need as need be. So on the ground, yes. to those of you who have 
who have attended the Gallery Talk training. Um, it's a bit like Camelot. It's a place that existed and it no longer exists. Um, and we're not totally depending on the historical reality, but we're also depending on, relative, on um, the strength of memory of some of these people. So um, some of it is truth, some of it is what people remember, but um, it is whatever, it's up to you to decide what you want to believe. As all of you know, what, what, how, what your memories were like. Oh, this is lovely. <laughs> Mexican families came in the years prior to or immediately after the Mexican Revolution, 
And with this migration, the name changed to Spanish Town. Not Mexican Town, Spanish Town. Because, number one, the people did speak Spanish, and it was also more, it was considered more socially appropriate to refer to uh, people of Mexican descent as Spanish. It gave them that kind of Euro European romanticism, you know, romanticized them a little bit. Thank you to Charles Lummis. Um, yes, it made it, uh, yes, it was a little more bank, more bank of the term. So, but again, the area wasn't looked upon favorably by locals. You had Farad Store and Bakery that catered to the residents in the area that was on the corner of Main Street and South Ventura Avenue, and there was a Buckhorn Pool Hall that was owned by Charlie Farad, the Moomont Bar, the Perean, uh, that was a house of ill repute. Um, so, but you also had places like the Anna Kappa Barber Shop. This was located in the Anna Kappa Hotel, which is uh, where the Top Hat used to be located. That was the Anna, that corner was the Anna Kappa Hotel. You had two young barbers that started their careers there. There was Paul Sanchez and his brother Joe. We have this photograph that one of our Tortilla Flats um, residents unearthed for this exhibit. We don't know which one is Paul Sanchez or his brother Joe, but we do have, we know that they're one of those four barbers in the picture. So Paul was known by the name Jaime. We don't know why, because he wasn't German, um, but they called him Jaime. He was known as Jaime Sanchez. And we only found out his last name in the last few months. But he began his work as a barber uh, at the Anacapa Barber Shop, Anacapa Hotel Barber Shop. But he was uh, destined for greater things. So Heine decided to open up his own barber shop in the Farad building. How many of you know the uh, location of Phil's barber shop that was run by Phil Marcus for so many years? Yes. Well, Phil's barber shop is just down the street on uh, West Main Street, in that the corner of West Main, uh, West Main and South Venture Avenue is the old Farad building, and Phil, Phil Marcus was located there for many years. Prior to that, it was Heine's barber shop. Heine also opened a pool hall that was directly across the street from the San Buena Ventura Mission. So we had the pool hall going and the barber shop. And Heine was a barber by trade, but um, as I said, he was destined for bigger things. So he would run numbers games and crap games and uh, <laughs> poker parties in the back room of the barber shop. Well, in 1936, Phil Marcus, having just recently, you know, uh, gotten his uh, barber license, came to Heine and said that he wanted to apprentice with him. And Heine would keep putting him off and say, no, 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 uh, no, he didn't need an apprentice. And uh, Phil Marcus kept at him and at him, and he finally agreed to do it. With one caveat, he had to be the front man for his numbers games. So Phil Marcus thought about it and re reluctantly agreed at first, and it turned out to be a good, good uh, partnership. Heine Sanchez, although he was running this el these illegal games out of his back room, was a very generous man. He, he was the person that people went to when they needed loans, but he was anything, you know, he was not a loan shark at all. He would give people money and they could pay it back whenever they could, or if they couldn't pay it back, then that was okay. So he was, uh, he was very generous with the people of Tortilla Flats. Um, that's a little bit off topic, but I just wanted to tell you a little bit. I want you to know a little bit about what these people were like and what they did. Okay. In 1931, the rain stops on the southern plains of the United States. That's the panhandles of Texas, Oklahoma, western Kansas, and the eastern portions of Colorado and New Mexico. So by 1940, you have 200,000 migrants, migrants that enter California. Most of these end up in the San Joaquin Valley, um, taking jobs in the fields that were left by Mexican uh, immigrants that re were repatriated during the 1930s. But there were a lot that came to Ventura, and most of them camped out along the Ventura River. We have encampments now. This is what was happening then. Eventually, a trailer park um, pops out of this area. It was on the westernmost end of uh, the river. It was right along River Street, and it was here that these migrants settled in this trailer park. Eventually, there were small houses built there. There was a little court, there were little courts, and this became this was called Shore Acres. But to everyone in the area, it was known as Okies Flats. Didn't matter where you came from; these were Okies. Um, it was not a place that people frequented. 
But Shore Acres did have movies on one night of the week, either Friday or Saturday, where they put up a big sheet and everyone from Tortilla Flats could go and watch a movie there. And that was the one time that people went to Shore Acres or Oki's Flats. The children from this community also attended school together with the children from Tortilla Flats and the school that they attended was May Henning, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, This is a picture of Benny Enriquez. Benny Enriquez owned Benny's Market that was located in Tortilla Flats. It was at the end of South Ventura Avenue, close to Front Street. Uh, Benny worked at the Safeway Market in Oxnard, but always aspired to have his own business. So he came to Ventura and opened this market. And he was also another person who was very generous to the people of Tortilla Flats, would give them credit, didn't matter if you could pay your account or not, but he wanted to make sure that people had food in their mouths and food to feed their families. Uh, Benny's Market closed. Uh, Benny's moved across to Mita Street, which is now Thompson Boulevard. Um, sort of across, uh, what is the name of that place? There's a coffee shop at the corner of, let's see. I don't know, where the wave is, does anybody know where the wave is? Right next door there's an empty lot. Next to that empty lot was Benny's Market. It's no longer there, but that's where, the, that's where Benny's number two was located. Benny's Market finally went out of business, uh, not because the freeway took it out, but because of the rerouting of traffic with the freeway. Um, there, he had very little business, so eventually ended up closing his business in the 1950s. Area that the children attended. We had May Henning School, which was located directly behind the museum. That is also an empty lot now. It used to be the school district offices. Um, and Holy Cross School, which was located and still is at the Mission, San Buena Ventura. This is a picture of the sixth grade class of 1930 at Holy Cross School.
So we have Juanita and Carlos Valenzuela lived in Tortilla Flats on South Ventura Avenue. Um, they live next door to, well, this is the interior of their home. Um, if you look in the exhibit, this is sort of what we based the small living, there's a little living room set in there, and we took, this is one of the few interior shots that we have of anybody's home in Tortilla Flats. So we kind of took that idea and went with it to create a little living room environment in the exhibit itself. Juanita and Carlos Valenzuela lived on South Ventura Avenue. They lived next door to the Giovanni Colas. Giovanni Cola was a baker at Farad's General Mer Merchandise and Bakery. And uh, the Valenzuela girls told me while we, they were being interviewed that they didn't grow up on tortillas like other Mexican families. They grew up with, on sourdough bread and panettone because this is what Mr. Cola would, would have at the bakery and he would bring it home and uh, always share with his neighbors. Um, a lot of the residents of Tortilla Flats told me that they could go to the back door of the bakery and Mr. Cola would be baking bread in the wood ovens in the back and they could always get bread. And so the children always had something to eat, which was really nice. Also, people that attended the Green Mill Ballroom and went to dances or listened to bands at the Green Mill would always say that after having been to an event at the Green Mill, they could always go back to the bakery because Mr. Cola would already be baking for the next day. So they could go back to uh, behind the bakery and he'd hand out sourdough bread for people that were hungry after a dance. So this is Mr. This is Juanita and Carlos Valenzuela that lived on South Ventura Avenue in front of their house. I talk about Vincent Diaz. We talked about the mission being a kind of a cultural place or a place where people could go and worship. There were actually two other churches in Tortilla Flats. There was Mount Olivet Baptist Church and there was the Iglesia Mexicana Apostolica, which was an evangelistic church that was also on South Ventura Avenue. Um, so there were three places in this small community where you could go and worship. There were many places that people considered um, uh, cultural venues, places where they could hang out. One of those was Heine's Pool Hall on Main Street. Um, you had Seaside Park, Seaside Park, which, um, Punky, there was another, there was another park, part of Seaside Park, is that correct? That was on South, Vent was it on South Ventura Avenue? I'm familiar with Seaside Park. Right, there was another small park that was sort of oval in shape that was part of Seaside Park um, that extended out into the community and it was a rather large park where people would take their children to play, have picnic, picnics, etc. But Seaside Park was a great cultural venue. Um, the Mexican-American community would hold 16th of September celebrations at Seaside, Seaside Park. They would have um, food booths that were up, they would have music, they had a coronation for a queen and her court, so it was a huge celebration. Uh, there was also Babe Ruth Field at Seaside Park, and the children would go out there and watch uh, baseball games. There were minor league uh, teams that played in Ventura during that period of time, and uh, the kids from Tortilla Flats couldn't afford going into the baseball games, so they would look through the knot holes in the fence to watch the games. And the Chamber of Commerce uh, started noticing that these kids were standing outside looking through the knot holes or, or over the fence. And they decided to start this club for the boys called the Not Hold Club. They had actual membership cards, and they could get into the games for free with their membership cards. So um, it was a great thing for the children of Tortilla Flats to have that. Um, the bathhouse was another venue as well, although it was further down um, um, the strand over here on the beach. But um, they would go. They would have a tea time club at the bath bathhouse where they could go and dance, and there'd be records and music and, and uh, snacks so that they could uh, spend time there as well. The one venue that we had the most trouble finding information about was the Green Mill Ballroom. Nobody seems to have any pictures of the Green Mill Ballroom. Um, we found some photographs that were given to us by um, Punky's cousin that uh, talked that, that, that were actually shots of people that actually played at the Green Mill, like Glenn Miller and um, Benny Goodman, uh, bands like that. But we don't have any actual pictures, but we did find one interior shot of the Green Mill Ballroom that is up in the exhibit. And um, Tony ended up putting on her Facebook page, she ended up asking people, if you have anything on the Green Mill Ballroom, we would love to have it for this exhibit. 
we got a ticket uh, to uh, truck to the Green Mill to see uh, what was it, Harry James, I believe, from this woman in Las Vegas. And it was just sent to us, and we do have it, and we want to put it in the exhibit, and we didn't have time to get it ready, but it will be in there. It's just amazing. We have these little bits of information keep coming to us. So it's amazing. Did anybody here ever have parents or anyone that went to the Green Mill? <laughs> Roberta, yes, and Roberta's giving me some information about her father at the Green Mill Ballroom, and we have some quotes of his as well, which is which is wonderful. It was apparently quite the venue. Um, you could see Artie Shaw, and there were so many big names that came to Ventura during that time. Um, the, dis the disappearance of Tortilla Flats uh, was not unique to Ventura, as you'll find out when Charles is talking to you about the freeway. Um, there were so many low- and middle-income neighborhoods across the country that for the sake of progress and transportation, uh, were being obliterated during the late 50s and early 60s. This was called the reshaping of America. Uh, in the 1950s, the city decided to negotiate the purchase of homes from their owners. Um, understand that this was a community that already was made to feel marginalized. Um, and they were supposed to receive fair market value for their homes, but as usual, progress was a priority, so residents didn't protest. They took whatever they could get. Um, their mantra was, you can't fight City Hall. So inside their own homes and their community, the protests and the cries were heard. Uh, money received was minimal. Most many residents were renters, so they had no choice but to move out and move in with relatives uh, up the avenue or find another place in the county that had low rents. There were only a few families that were actually evicted, um, and we have yet to find any evidence of this. Um, the Leroy Gibson family was one that was evicted. Gibson's had Gibson's family barbecue. They were an African-American family that lived behind, it's, it's actually an empty lot now behind Tony's Pizza off of Thompson Boulevard. Um, they were married and had children and had, were running the Gibson's barbecue. But they were told by the city that they needed that, that green belt, that easement. So what happened was the Gibson's were moved out of that home the home and the business were totally uh, taken apart, they were destroyed, and the family was destroyed as well. Mrs. Gibson ended up staying in Ventura, Mr. Gibson went to Port Wainimi, and they, the, it ended up in divorce. Um, they ended up having to pay taxes on the property even though they didn't live in the area any longer. So it, it's been a, a, a there's some harsh, harsh stories coming out of this as well. Um, so, I don't know if you have any questions about this, but I'm giving you a little bit of information. Charles will continue with the freeway. Yes, Sarah? Where was the ballroom? The Green Mill Ballroom was at the end of Main Street, and it was on Main and Julian Street, which is down close to the river on this side. It's no longer there. The building doesn't, doesn't exist any longer. But, uh, and we have no idea what it really looked like. It's just, you know, people have told us that it looked like a huge green windmill. Others say it had a small green windmill on top, so it, it, it's just, uh, you know, unless we find a picture of it, we really don't know what it looked like. Anyone else? Okay, I'm going to let Charles take over and he'll tell you about the freeway coming through. Thank you. 
was swinging around and crossing the high of Patagonia. And I said, you know where we are right now? My wife said, where? I said, we're on the, we're on the tag in the Cocaine Plaza. And it's exactly true. And so it's like, I'll never ever see that chunk of freeway again in the same way. Um, the image that happens to be up on the screen right now, on, on the left, you'll see that large pile of dirt. That is, that is one quarter of Tortilla Flats where they created a burn. So you're looking between the fairgrounds and uh, Nathan. And that's exactly what part of this community was. And this is exactly what happened. This is in the 1960s, and I'll talk about exactly what that, specifically about that image of the bit. Um, the second point I want to talk about is something I want to address, because I really think it needs to be talked about. Several times in the press, I have seen the statement that someone came to research at the museum library and there was nothing, and I quote, nothing about Tortilla Flats. Well, that's just not true. It's what you look for, and it's what you call it. Um, John Steinbeck's novel, Tortilla Flat, came out in 1935. So, technically, there was no Tortilla Flats before 1935. There were people, of course, as others already delineated. So, what were you calling it? Indian Town, Tiger Town, as she says. We have a wonderful photograph that's in the exhibit taken by John Calvin Brewster in 1882, which shows that it's, um, there's a number of homes there. Almost all of them are Shumash residents um, on Nathan Street, which becomes Thompson Boulevard. So there's 